Today I'll be servicing the iconic Illinois Bun Special. This 21 joule railroad grade movement, which was manufactured in 1920, was recased in a classic watch case company gold plated case, which features a salesman style case back. The Bun Special is Illinois Watch Company's most well recognized railroad watch and is named after the Bun family, who co founded the original organization in 1870. This watch appears to be in overall excellent condition, but the movement has a major, major gremlin that isn't immediately apparent. As I've seen time and time again, appearances can be deceiving. For now, I'm just checking the watch over, testing basic functions like time setting, all to establish a baseline before I start taking the thing apart. The movement will run when wound, but it's anybody's guess how well it actually performs. The owner sent this to me asking for it to be serviced, not expecting anything major to be needed. Visually, the amplitude looks good, but that's only part of the story. The watch is running significantly slow, as much as 5 minutes per day, and positional variance is on the order of 30 seconds or so, but I guess that's to be expected if old oils are interfering with consistent power delivery. I start by removing the hands with the Presto Puller. There are two case screws securing the movement into the case. Once I remove these, the movement can be swung out from the front. There are three dial foot screws along the rim of the movement plate. Each screw presses against one of the three feet soldered to the underside of the dial. This is what prevents the dial from falling off the front of the movement. The dial itself has several hairline cracks in the enamel. While the cracks themselves cannot be repaired, the small bit of dirt that makes their way into the cracks is really what makes them visible. Denture cleaner tablets work really well at cleansing these dials, making those hairlines far less visible. I'll get it soaking and checked back in 24 hours or so. The hour wheel is now removed. The balance is now removed, but I've gone ahead and first loosened the set screw so that the hairspring stud can fall free of the balance cock as I lift it away. Ooh, doing so exposes evidence of a crime committed against this poor movement. More on that later. The next step before disassembling the train of wheels is to let down the remaining power of the main spring. By holding back the click, I can allow the spring to unwind itself in a controlled manner using a spare crown and stem. Hmm, crown and stem, great name for a bar. The pallet bridge and pallet fork are now removed. This is where the balance cock sits. It looks like someone filed down the plate, maybe realized they went too far and then decided to shim it back up with a sliver of watch paper. The train wheel bridge is now uninstalled. I'm beginning to remove the barrel bridge and its components. Note on these movements the crown wheel screw is reverse threaded.
The click is now removed. The crown wheel is lifted away. The ratchet wheel is uninstalled. The click spring is carefully convinced out of its slot. The barrel bridge is now removed. The mainspring barrel is uninstalled. I'm using a small steel plate to press against the barrel arbor so that it pops the lid off from the other side. With the arbor removed, I can unwind the mainspring out of the barrel. It doesn't look bad, not too tired, but this movement will receive a brand new one. The internal stem is now removed. The fourth wheel, escape wheel, and third wheel are lifted away. The cannon pinion is removed on the dial side, which allows the center wheel to fall free. The small bridge plate over the minute wheel is removed along with the minute wheel. The setting lever and yoke are uninstalled. The dial side jewels for the balance, pallet fork, and escape wheel are capped. Each of them have been scored, presumably to remind the service person which one goes where. With the screws removed, the jewels can be punched out with the help of the staking set. Each pair of settings is a cap jewel and a hole jewel. I like to remove them so they can be cleaned separately, and I know that oil or other dirt doesn't remain trapped in between them. The upper balance jewels are staked out as well. The upper escape wheel jewel is also capped and will be removed like the rest. Finally, the upper pallet fork hole jewel and cap jewel are punched out for cleaning. Okay, so I'm inspecting all the parts and it was at this time I made an interesting discovery. Does something about this balance staff seem... off to you? Something's going on with that lower pivot. The hairspring is levered off from the top of the staff. Since I'm dealing with a double roller balance, I'll use my trusty Rex Roller Remover tool. When mounted in the staking set, these angry beaver teeth do a nice job of securing the roller at the base of the staff so that the balance can be safely punched free of the roller table.
Okay, so one of three things could have happened here. One, a mouse with carbide teeth decided to use this staff as a tasty treat. Two, a um, resourceful craftsman decided to whittle himself a balance staff. Or three, this is not the correct staff for the movement and someone tried to file it down to fit. Needless to say, this staff will no longer see the inside of any movement. I'm using the KND number 50 staff remover helper, which clamps the arms of the balance while the staff is punched out. Since the staff is riveted to the arm, the arm needs to be secured during the punching process or the arm will fold up as the staff is pressed down. The new staff is placed in the staking anvil, and I lower the balance wheel over top to prepare it for riveting. I will now use a round-faced punch to expand the riveting shoulder of the staff. When I'm satisfied with the strength of the rivet, I will finish it off by flattening any remaining lip with a flat-faced punch so that the hairspring collet sits as flush to the balance as possible. I was only able to find a replacement staff with size 0.12mm pivots. Because the hold jewels are also 0.12mm, the staff will need to be modified to fit properly. I really only need to reduce the size of the pivots by between 0.01 to 0.02mm to give the staff the freedom it needs to turn within the jewel holes without introducing any excessive side shake. I'm going to accomplish this with the help of my burnisher and jacket lathe. While the primary purpose of burnishing is to work hard on a surface, it does remove a small amount of material in the process. If I do this in a controlled way, I can achieve the precise size I want. The Bergen burnisher I'm using has one rounded edge to help preserve the conical shape of the pivot shoulder. And now a little compare and contrast against what was replaced. The upper roller table is now reinstalled in the approximate orientation it was before. The safety roller is reinstalled, ensuring the four corn slot is centered over the impulse jewel. Anytime balance work is performed, it's always good to double check the poise and make any adjustments as necessary. I do not want wide oscillations like this. Instead, I want to see the balance coast freely in one direction and come to a smooth stop with very minimal backlash. Poise was achieved in combination of adding weight to the lighter side by placing timing washers under the screws, or by removing weight from the heavier side by shaving material off the underside of some of the screws.
After cleaning, all the hole jewels and cap jewels are pushed back into their respective positions in the plates and bridges. It's very important these aren't mixed up. The version 1A automatic oiler is used to deposit the precise amount of Mobius 9010 through the whole jewel onto the end stone. I'm purposefully excluding the pallet fork as a matter of general practice. The thought behind this is the pallet fork has a limited range of motion anyway, and its speed directly contributes to the amplitude of the balance. Any oil in the pivots would slow down the snappy motion even if it's just by a little bit. The balance is reinstalled to the cock by inserting the hairspring stud into the hole and securing it with the set screw. It's good practice to dry fit the balance as this is typically the source of many issues. And it's much easier to diagnose those issues now than if the movement was fully assembled. There's something preventing the free movement of this balance, and I think I know what's going on. Recall the butchering of the main plate and the subsequent shimming of the cock that had to be done as a result. As it turns out, the balance cock is deformed, bent down, likely to compensate for the bizarre staff that probably wasn't designed for this movement. I will do my best to straighten it out with the help of a hand vise. Easy does it. Now this is the type of motion I'd expect. As a rule of thumb, the balance should move for a good 30 seconds at least before coming to a stop. The yoke is now reinstalled. A bit of Mobius D5 is applied to the inner rim where it will rotate along the screw. The setting lever is now fitted to the movement. Mollycoat DX grease is applied to the metal to metal hard sliding surfaces. The minute wheel is installed after applying a small amount of D5 to its post. The guard plate is placed back over the minute wheel. Mobius D5 lubricates the bottom of the barrel before the mainspring is installed. This movement will receive a brand new white alloy mainspring to replace the old carbon steel spring.
The spring and arbor are lightly oiled with D5 before the lid is snapped back on. The internal winding and setting stem is lightly touched with DX grease before the pinion and sliding clutch are slid into place. The faces where the sliding clutch and pinion rotate together are also lightly greased. The stem is now installed, and the yoke is situated into the slot on the sliding clutch on the other side. This third wheel has a pivot that will need to be addressed. Under close magnification, you can see how the upper pivot has been worn and formed into the shape of a mushroom. Fortunately, the jacket lathe was already set up from earlier, so all I needed was to reconfigure the tailstock runner for the correct size. The pivot is burnished so that the surface is restored to its original, smooth cylindrical form. And a little before and after comparison. The third wheel is now placed onto the main plate along with the main spring barrel. The escape wheel and fourth wheel are lowered into position. Finally, the second wheel is installed. The barrel bridge is now installed. The train wheel bridge is fitted to the movement. I'm using light pressure from a peg while gently manipulating the wheels until all three pivots find their holes. The click spring is installed. A peg helps prevent it from pinging into orbit should my tweezer hand decide to twitch the wrong way. The click is installed after lubricating its post with some D5. D5 lightly lubricates some high friction touch points of the ratchet wheel. I also lightly oil the sliding surfaces where the crown wheel will rotate.
The palette jewels are each oiled with a droplet of Mobius 941. These are the faces of the palette that slide against the teeth of the escape wheel. The watch will still run without them being oiled, but doing so helps with performance. And now the pallet bridge is lowered on top of the pallet fork. Light constant pressure from a peg allows me to manipulate the fork with my tweezer until the pivot is seated. All train wheel pivots are oiled with Mobius 9010. The cannon pinion is now installed. It friction fits over the center wheel arbor on the dial side. I'm excited to see if replacing that balance staff improved performance. I'm carefully lowering the balance into place, ensuring the impulse jewel is on the receiving side of the pallet fork. I just love that sound. Not bad, and a healthy amplitude. I strive to stay above 220 for vintage timepieces, over 270 being ideal. Any beat error under one millisecond for any fixed stud carrier balance is acceptable, and timekeeping looks good as well in various positions. The arrow wheel and dial washer are now installed. The dial has soaked for about a day in denture cleaner. If I'm being honest, it looks quite nice and I can barely notice the hairlines. The three dial foot screws are tightened, securing the dial to the movement. I'd like to thank Johannes for sending me his watch to service and to repair. During the process I took the opportunity to learn a little more about the company behind this beautiful timepiece. The Illinois Watch Company was actually first established in 1870 as the Springfield Watch Company in Springfield, Illinois. Springfield operated under that name until it reorganized in 1877 and became the Illinois Springfield Watch Company. However, just a year later, the company faced financial difficulties and had to reorganize again, this time assuming the name Illinois Watch Company in 1878, the final name of the organization. It operated under that name until 1928, when it was sold by the heirs of John and Jacob Bunn to the Hamilton Watch Company of Lancaster, Pennsylvania for $5 million. Hamilton continued to allow Illinois to manufacture watches in its factory until it closed in 1932 due to preservation measures taken as a result of the Great Depression. Hamilton Watch Company itself eventually became a Swiss brand in the late 1960s and still exists today as part of the Swatch Group.
So I definitely learned a few things while making this video, and I hope you all learned something as well. But if not, I hope you at least found it enjoyable. Thanks for fixing watches with me today, and I'll see you in the next one.